the Board of Health meeting is open. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted via remote participation. I'm gonna conduct, conduct a roll call to make sure everyone, uh, the committee members, uh, video and audio is working properly. And I wanna remind people that the meeting is being recorded to the web and may be shown on Amherst Media and broadcast on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Okay, the meeting is called to order and I'm gonna ask who's present. Maureen? Present. Steve? Here. Okay. Timothy? Here. John? Here. Okay, we're all here, and Nancy is here. And Emma, too, now. Emma's here, too. <laughs> but Emma's not here yet. Yes, she is. Uh -oh. Emma, are you hi. here? <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, hi, Emma. Oh, Welcome. What a, um, what a day. I'll this bet. was a day for the book. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me know if you need any more help on days. I certainly will. These days, that, okay. may, that may not hold until tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> Emma. okay so we're going to review. Pardon me? Sorry, it's, An Emma it's Angela. Yes, I, Emma, right, with right. your permission, can I make you host and make Nancy co-host? Yeah, and then you can bounce. All right, my friend. And we're in step six of phase one still, correct? We're in step three of phase one. Perfect. Yes. I've been, I've been following that via your email. Yeah. I'll send you the image of right where we're at. Okay. I'm on the phones tomorrow. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Bye. Angela. Have a good Thanks. meeting. Thanks. Okay. So first we're going to review the minute, minute meeting, minutes of the meeting of December 12th. And when people are ready, I'd like uh, any discussion and then a motion to accept. I have a question, uh, a correction or for the part Bus new business number one, the physician need for COVID vaccinations. Right. It doesn't quite capture what I meant to say, although I might have said that. Okay. Um, oh, no. No, go for it. Yeah. I think the part about the medical reserve court doesn't apply. It's just that's what I mentioned when I discovered the fact that um, physicians and nurses are um, granted immunity in uh, administering immunization and other protective programs. So it doesn't have to do with the actual medical reserve corps in any way. Oh, you just uh, delete that sentence. Yeah. Let, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, we could just delete that. Or what, what would you suggest? Is that no, that, that seems fine. Cause that, oh. and is also, then I am able to do it. So that's new. That was the news there. Um, yeah just was how I discovered that. I that, see. Uh, <laughs> that had to do with that. So got it. Got it. Okay. Otherwise. Yeah. Sure. Great. Okay. I'll do that. Yep. Any other comments, corrections, clarifications? I, I don't know if this is necessary or not. And Emma should weigh in, but uh, the, the line uh, about the Moderna product, which unlike the Pfizer vaccine does not require minus 80 degrees C refrigeration. So that's true, but it, it doesn't give anything what it does require, which might be useful to have relative. It's not like it, it, yeah. uh, you cook it in the stove or something. So, um, sure. It sure. might be good yeah. to mention that Nemo must know. <laughs> yeah, so standard freezer temperature is around 26 degrees is ideal. And then 20, it can be stored in the refrigerator for 30 days. So 26 F is Fahrenheit below free, just below freezing. Is that what you mean? Or minus 26 C? No, she means the, the former. I'll change it to, to uh, Celsius. So minus two Celsius. Yeah, something like that, yeah. 
Okay. Well, anyway, I just, it might be valuable to mention what the Mardana. Yeah, it says 26 degrees Celsius. Oh, no. Minus 26. No, no way, no way, no way. I thought it did have those requirements. It, does. it was colder than yeah. most normal refrigerator. It wasn't minus 80, but it wasn't casual. Okay. So I, <laughs> it was being something that maybe you might use for other vaccines like varicella or something like that. I okay. Okay. Minus 26 Celsius. You got it. And then, and then just regular refrigerator for up to what? For up to 30 days. Okay. I'll put that in. Good. It's much more user friendly, it sounds like. Yeah. Yes. That's why they gave it to us and, and most of the people in the community because it's easier to store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's just get the minutes done. Lots of questions about this stuff for uh, down the road, but anyway, let's get the minutes done. Any, any more? Corrections, comments, additions. Can I have a motion to accept the minutes as corrected? I'll make a motion to motion. accept the minutes as corrected. Second. Second. Okay. All in second. favor? Okay. Aye. John, second. <laughs> All in favor, Tim? Aye. Are you? Aye. John? Aye. John? Aye. Aye. Steve? Aye. Are you hearing me? I, you seem to be breaking delayed? up a little. Okay. Yeah, you're Maureen? A little weak. Aye. Okay. okay. I could always go to my iPad. Um, and Nancy, aye. Okay. So next on the agenda is prohibiting smoking in workplace and public places. Maureen, thank you for your work on it. Yeah, I, I apologize for getting it out like yesterday, Am I still but I had a big computer meltdown, kind of rolling meltdown going on for the last two weeks and I would be able to do it and then I couldn't see it. And anyway, I, I thought I, since it was on the agenda, I would get this together and send it out. And I sent two versions. One is with, you know, without all the cross outs and options and, and comments. And the other one just shows what those options were. So um, I didn't get, um, there was some question that we would get some wording on, on things from DJ, which I don't think we have yet. And I think that had to do with the um, oh, yeah. ride sharing car, ride sharing cars, um, and maybe municipal, not municipal, but um, membership clubs, which I thought we decided not to regulate at this time, um, as we don't perceive a problem. But I don't know if anyone had actual time to kind of check on that. Um, so. Any, I don't know if people had a chance to read through and if they had questions as they did so. Um, Steve helped me um, update the references and um, otherwise, I mean, it actually seems kind of straightforward, but we might wanna go through the, that list, you know, of part, whatever that part is with all the different places that smoking is not allowed. Um, I Okay, I just had a comment about even changing the title of it. Well, I actually wondered about that too, the title and the first paragraph, but I didn't do it. Right, so I, I thought regulating, prohibiting smoking and vaping in workplaces and public places. And then in the last sentence uh, where it says, Scientific evidence indicates that there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke or e-cigarette aerosol with a parenthesis vape. 
Only yeah. the scientific evidence is sort of iffy, although I, I went and I checked a few, but it's, it's not hard and fast, but the evidence is beginning to come out. So I don't know how it want to word that. Right, even the reference that we found that had a review of the literature about outdoor exposure to secondhand vape products, um, it was kind of iffy, but, but they felt like the studies weren't all that high quality, so. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I think because of COVID, the research on this is all put on the back burner. So let me just, how, I noticed that the, the model didn't change the title or the um, first paragraph, I don't think. It did not, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't. Um, I think it would be important to get the word vape. Okay. Um, and then also it's called, vape is really e-cigarette aerosol and we could add that definition, e-cigarette aerosol parentheses vape. Mm -hmm. um, as a definition in, in the- as a definition, definition and also- Just in the also, first paragraph it, a self. In, in the definitions and also, I don't know if, what people think about having a definition of vaping, which is the, action of ex exhaling and inhaling vapor aeros uh, aerosol containing nicotine um, and flavoring by a device designated for that purpose. I can um, send all this to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Since that and then um, of what we're talking about. Um, right, and then in the 2016 e-cigarette use among youth from the Surgeon General, which was Murphy, it stated that electronic cigarette aerosol is not harmless. It can contain harmful constituents, including nicotine, flavoring with, and then it, and volatile organic compounds, heavy metals, and cancer-causing chemicals is another thing that I found, and, and I can send you that reference. It's from 2016. Okay. Although that doesn't talk about second I, 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 exposures particularly, uh, or maybe it does. No, but wait a minute, I read someplace I read, but there again, the science is not solid yet because the research hasn't been out but right. one one place i read talked about that they can contain these these compounds mm -hmm. do we really believe that scientific evidence indicates that there is no risk free level of anything. I mean, that is not literally true. Right. <laughs> I would leave that sentence out. That's not the purpose. We, and I would say that's true for smoking as well as vaping. You could say omit scientific evidence, being, um, Steve, and just say well, there is no risk free level of exposure to secondhand smoke. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we do everything. Anything we say is based on scientific evidence. And so we shouldn't say something that's not true. The scientific, there's no, you know, we don't need to go into this, but this is not a good thing to say. And it's not the purpose that's in this statement of purpose. Later on, it gives the references. I would leave that sentence out. The whole sentence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it just says what we're going to do rather than why we're going to oh. oh, I guess, wait a minute, maybe that is the only place that the references are referenced. Okay, well, in that case, we better leave it in or something like it because, yeah, we need to have a place in the document that mentions the references, and I guess that is the place. All right, well. Is there a better way to say it that's not <laughs> no risk level? It indicates there is risk to exposure to secondhand smoke.
documented risks. I mean, there it is. Secondhand smoke is definitely documented risks. Oh That's yes, oh yes, but not, part. but not. There is no risk-free level. Right. Um, so what what they mean is that you know nobody's found you know at the levels that can be detected, there's a risk. So yeah, uh, scientific evidence indicates a risk of exposure. Just uh, just yeah. a, a a point of reference. I was I googled uh, looking for a term for secondhand smoke and aerosols, you know, vaping aerosols. And I came up with an article, it's April, 2019, Preventing Chronic Disease. And so the acronyms, the secondhand smoke is, is the acronym is SHSS and aerosol, secondhand aerosol from e-cigarettes is, is an acronym is SHA, secondhand aerosols, uh, just as an acronym. But in about the third paragraph, there is no risk-free level of SHS exposure, citing number two. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, no, no. I know people yeah. like to write, but I, that's, this is from. Uh, yeah, I think we didn't make that up. I, I mean, that was in there before, and yeah, I, that was yeah, 2010 or whenever there was reason to, to write that down. Um, although it does seem hard to prove. It's not, it, you know, that's definitely not literally true. So just say scientific evidence <clears throat> indicates a risk of exposure. Okay. Oh, it's from the CDC. We don't, who would believe them anyway? Right now. <laughs> I came across that one today, John, too. Should we yeah, call this? Is, their citation is a Surgeon General report from 2006. Yeah, and I think we updated that. Um, and if you look through the 2016 Surgeon General's report on e-cigarettes, a lot of that comes up on that. So it's a 2016 document. I'm trying to figure out where that um, so do we want to have separately talk about secondhand smoke and secondhand aerosols or combine them or what are we thinking here? Well, I, we want to combine them, I think. Yeah. Which is possible, yeah. No, it gets a little awkward in that first paragraph to, to combine them. I'm confused because I thought there's like uh, my one nine revision doesn't seem to have the right. Oh, it does. It still has, it has the correct, or at least the, the reference I thought it did. It was still 2006, but it was viewed on 20, in 2020. Okay. But if we can update that, that's good too. How often in the document do we need to refer to both things? Not often. Several places, I, th I thought. Because basically it just, it doesn't refer to it except to say that um, use of e-cigarettes or other uh, electronic and nicotine delivery systems or whatever it is are banned wherever smoking is banned. So it doesn't really say that. Um, in in the section four smoking prohibited and smoke free environment that that implies e cigarette aer it, it states it number 3 vaping aerosol is part is what we mean by smoke is that right yeah it, or should it be like uh, in, in section four, I put down, it shall be the responsibility of the employer to provide a smoke slash vape free environment. Yeah, not vape, well. It, yeah. Again, I think I followed the model, which just put in the sentence, in, uh, number three, the use of e-cigarettes. And I think I added, and other electronic nicotine delivery systems is prohibited wherever smoking is prohibited. Mm -hmm. I think in the definitions, yeah. we include vaping also in smoking. So if you look yeah. at the definition of smoking, right. we had this in the second part of that 
paragraph, you can see including the use of electronic cigarettes. So I think we are already defining it as inclu you know, included in smoking. So, but it, so all we need to do is use some words in the opening thing that, that makes clear we're combined, these two things are together, right? Mm -hmm. I think Nancy's suggestion seemed to be simple, you know, just I mean, smoking and vaping, because that's the way people think about it. Um, and then in the first sentence of that first paragraph to say secondhand smoke and the aerosol, e cigarette aerosols or something. And yeah. I found in um, a 2017 article on, it's from Preventing Chronic Disease, Public Health Research Practice and Policy. It says, scientific evidence indicates the aerosol admitted by EVP, meaning the electronic vapor product, may expose non-users, including children and infants, to aerosolized nicotine and other potentially harmful substances, including heavy metals, ultra fine particles and volatile organic composts. Thus, aerosol, thus this aerosol is not as safe as clean air. Well, that sounds good. Cause I don't think we really addressed the vaping in the, in the references. Okay, so then I can systematic that. review of the health risk of passive exposure to electronic cigarette vapor. Um, I can I can type this up. What more? Uh, I mean, you know, the in the these are, you know, these are pretty recent. These other two, um, both the vaping one, um, and then also the outdoor areas, which is probably the harder one to demonstrate. So, so I, can, I can type this and send it to you, Maureen. Okay, sure. Oh, thank you. That's a misspelling. Just had a quick question. Um, if the scientific evidence shows that there is impact on children, but this uh, bylaw is essentially on the health of employees, should we still oh, consider that? They're public places. Well, the reason this says children is it was about it was about um, harm to children, so that's why they put children. But it says. Um, it, it can expose non-users, so and it said including children, so non-users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was, study cited also was like people being in the same room where someone else was using an e-cigarettes, e basically. And the article was focused on harm to children by secondhand aerosol. So, but it, the original part says expose non-users including children. Right. And the public places includes children in my mind too. And this was from the Surgeon General's report. And it says smoke-free indoor air policies should be updated to prohibit the use of both conventional cigarettes and e-cigarettes, thereby preserving the standard for clean 
indoor air. And that, that came from that 2016 report, just to support okay. us. I don't know if, know if you want to put it in. Yeah, I think we but, should um, some more support documents. I don't think it hurts to do that. Okay, well, I'll send all of this to you. I'll type it up at some point tomorrow and send it to you. If you just want to take a picture of it and <laughs> send it to me, that's okay. I like the sighting. Okay. And I hear something that in 2016, California, Delaware, Hawaii, Maine, North Dakota, New Jersey, Oregon, and Utah have enacted comprehensive smoke-free laws that prohibit conventional smoking and electronic vapor product use in all indoor areas of work sites, restaurants, and bars. So I don't know if I could go check. We could check there. For what? This what they, they have have, it or what they have? They've enacted comprehensive smoke-free laws, yeah. including they. This is all just supporting why we should ha include it. How about moving down to where we go through the different places um, in yeah. in uh, section four, and that would be number four right. in section four. So yeah, in A, you know, we I guess DJ said to leave that in, although it seems like it's no. I think I think where Maureen, I think what he said was to repeat the ban on smoking bars, so we don't have to have it. Uh, don't have to to uh, you know um, redundantly ban smoking in smoking bars. Okay, so we did do that number five smoking right. prohibited. So we can take out A. Right. And then nursing homes, that's not a change. Right. Vehicles controlled by the employer, that's not a change. Right. D went from fifty percent of rooms to all in bed and breakfast hotel and motel rooms. Um, and remember, we, we sort of hypothesized or we kind of predicted that none of them now do, even the bed and breakfast. But we don't really know that. And so we can do it. But um, might be a yeah. And the employed work, closed workplace, that is not changed. And we added, we just changed from retail tobacco stores to in adult only retail tobacco stores because that is our new term for those stores. <laughs> Good, yeah. And the outdoor areas where food and beverages are served to the public, that is what was in the uh, previous regulation. Um, and the 20 feet, I think we decided to leave at 20 feet. I think DJ said between 20 and 30 or something. 15 and, 15 and 25, 15 right. 25. So we were, I remember we were right in the middle of that, uh, of, on that. Um, this well, one is the one that, signage. excuse me? We'll have to get better signage for the municipal buildings. Because when we were when I was out at volunteering at the COVID clinic at Bangs, there's just one little sign on one place, and it's very small. So I don't know if people could see it. So we might want to encourage the town to get better signage for municipal buildings. Well, yeah, I don't know if we have those, but often there's also a place to 
drop your cigarette like a you know standing ashtray or something you know those those are trash can with the ash tray on top but that's one way uh maureen are, are you editing a document like as we i just did one thing is that terrible no i because i want to no i want to do you want to hear about any typos? Workplace is one word, for example, not two. Where is that? Oh, workplace. E. Yeah, it is telling me that, but I think maybe that may have come that way. Um, yeah, but it isn't, according to Merriam Webster. Anyway. Yeah, right. And yeah, it's, it's doubly underlined in mine, so it does tell me that's a problem. I just. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know if you want to hear about such things while we're looking, glancing, or not. Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so on in I, the, this is changed because um, some things are added. And so on town Odin playgrounds, I think that was there before. Yep. Parks, I don't think were. Right. Recreation areas, can't remember. Athletic fields w were only when there was a registered event. So I just deleted that. And swimming areas were mentioned in that, uh, in the previous one. I didn't specifically say the common and I don't know how that is represented here. Um, is it a town park or recreation area? Yeah, I don't know. Because then we would have to list the three, you know, the, the North Common, whatever. Was it Kendrick Park? Not Kendrick. Is it Kendrick? Yeah, Kendrick. Mm -hmm. And then what's the one with the fountain? Sweetster. 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 Including downtown parks? Well, it says parks now. Parks, yeah, that you know, other parks, the like Groff Park and Mill River, and and uh, there are lots of little parks that aren't, I mean, yeah, like Sweet Alice Brook, and all you know, all these little. You know, does that include like trail, those, those, what are trails like the Robert Frost trail, for example, is that a part of that, that's a recreation area? I don't know what that is either. Actually. It's a trail and I think the trails and also the um, bike path would be separate, different. There's, that's something different. Yeah, the bike path is controlled by DCR. So. Yeah, that's right, right. But uh, other trails are, I don't know actually who manages or controls those. Um, I'm, I'm guessing but, some are town and some I mean, yeah. are maybe managed by like Kestrel Trust or I, although maybe in coordination with the town. I know like Mount Pollux is, is kind of both. Um, so that might, is a trail of, yeah, I don't know. Do we want to include trails? Town owned trails? Like we have to figure out what those are. Well, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of trails. Like, you know, there's that one down by Mill River that goes from um, from Groff Park back to, you know, around. Right. So I, I have never seen anybody smoking ever, not even once on any of those, but I would I have believe it. <laughs> I don't know how people feel about that. I just leave well enough alone here that, you know, places where people are well enough alone. Excuse me? I say leave well enough alone and if... Yeah. It, it doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, is, Maureen, is I... I would imagine trails wouldn't want people smoking on them in case of fires. You know, the Holyoke Range and all of that you could have a fire if you throw lit yeah, and that, material. That's DCR too. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. Mostly. 
But Groff Park and Mill Mill River. Yeah, those, those are um, park. You know, those are included in parks and recreation areas. Um, I think it's good where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is item J from the sort of recommended thing, or can it was uh, actually it existed in our old guidelines or old regulations? I, so, I mean, I think the wording is not very good. Yeah, I. Um, I, my, I mean, I one. I think this is what it meant. I might write if I were to write it. Um, I would write in pub, uh, lowercase p public transportation vehicles. Well, that's that's covered by the state, and I don't think we have to do that. That uh, from what th that was the sense I had from DJ. Yes. What the areas like those bus stops or maybe places where people. Oh, so in public transportation. So maybe waiting is also areas. qualified by waiting areas. Okay, the wording is is crazy. Yeah, maybe waiting it's areas should come first. Waiting areas yes. first. Yes. Yes, for public transportation and how it, I don't know how to say that really, but uh, how about in waiting areas for public and private transportation services. Um, Taxi is not public, right? No. And that's what that's what we mean, right? In waiting areas for tra transportation services, correct? Yeah. Is there a taxi waiting area in Amherst? Yeah, it might be. Well, no. I think, I don't know that it's official, but I think there are a couple places, parking places that are designated for taxis near Normal the taxi stands. Yeah. I mean, why not just say in, I, I would advocate for in waiting areas for public and private transportation services, period. It covers it, all kinds of things. Bicycles, buses, taxis, horses, whatever. If it's a designated waiting area, then what number? Excuse me. What no? I can't find it in here. What number is that? J four J. Four J. Four J. I have on town owned athletic fields for J. Well, that must be the old I'm version. Welcome. Yeah, you got to look under Maureen's strikeout version, January 9th. Jan January 9th. The 1 9 20. Uh, I don't have. You sh I sent both 1 9 I and 1 have. 7. What you and I tried to send that one clean, but it yeah. didn't show up clean. It's in 1 7. I don't know. I printed several things, but I have two of the same. I guess I don't have that one then. <laughs> okay. I well, think up top, put like draft and the date. So I do. It's like no. I I have MM revisions one nine twenty one. Um, but it, it didn't the print file. out on the file. Oh. So okay. I, I don't I don't have yeah. it. Okay. I printed a bunch of stuff, but I don't have it. Um. So well, anyway, do, do you like that wording I proposed? Just to. So, uh, one aspect of that is uh, private transportation. Private ta transportation includes everything, right? Services. Even passenger vehicles, too, right? Yeah. It would, I think saying taxis is probably better because, well, you know, I mean, if I'm picking Tim up, I don't need to have, you know, it's. <laughs> it, how about this? How about this? I got a, a slight. Um, I would say okay. in designated, in designate. If it's a designated waiting area, I don't care who's coming to. To. We're talking about areas where humans wait to meet these services. Correct. That's what we care about. That and they're what designated. Is designated. What? Designated. I, I think it's a loose definition, right? I mean, if you look at uh, well, it's less loose than I mean taxi waiting area or bus wait. I don't know. Yeah, I mean uh, Uber and Lyft. Well, that was areas are all over, <laughs> right? Right, but there are places like an airport. There are some places in towns and 
things oh, where there are designate. designated signs for those waiting areas. You don't want people smoking there. But I don't think we have those. <laughs> I know, there but we're is. writing a regulation for the ages, Nancy. This is going to outlive. Okay. Um, Got it. Um, I think in something like, you know, I was just trying to use a, a simple words that capture all kinds of modes of transportation. To me, the key area is key that is, is some kind of designated waiting area where people are supposed to wait for transportation and smoking shouldn't be allowed. So in designated waiting areas for, tr for tr in designated transportation waiting areas? No. Waiting areas for no. public or private for transit services is what the John said. How about um, designated public waiting areas? Uh, <laughs> meaning, meaning it takes away your front lawn if you're waiting for Uber to pick you up. That's, that's yeah, that's not, you don't have a sign on your front lawn saying. No, you don't. So, I mean, I think the word designated only appears when it's public, but that's, you know. Yeah, I was trying to look to see if the um, model had anything to say specifically about that, but it, it, it doesn't really. No, I'm. I'm probably sensitive to the, or thinking about the words here because I work in civil and environmental engineering. I have a transportation group and the transportation modes are constantly training. It could be a scooter waiting area. It could be a, I mean, there's lots of kinds of waiting areas these days. So presume a lot of vertical takeoff and landing taxes, um, you know, kinds of things. Drones. <clears throat> Why don't I go with that and send it around again and see how we do some I'll try to get that wording from mostly based on what you just said, John. Yep. Um, and then I oh. K, I just read the wording, which is in vehicles of ride sharing services while they are engaged in providing rides to the public. All right, you got that one. Okay, good. Not and then, the uh, back back. To Jay, do we want to have during registered events or just in town owned athletic fields, period? Because I took out the registered events. I just said athletic okay, fields. Well I, I did find the one with the other eye, but it, it had it on. Okay, I don't know. I just I have so many versions of this that I printed out in the last day. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> The late, the late action on my part didn't help. Um, Are you out of that print world yet, Nancy? <laughs> I'm such a paper and pencil person. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense to you? They're just leaving out that qualification? Yes. Yeah. And I think so. I'll... Any more comments? Do you think we got through that major section? Everyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and number five is smoking bars are prohibited in the town of Amherst. So that just. Yeah. Yep. And enforcement did not change except for section five, which just um, adjusted the 4.3, 4.4, 4.5 from whatever it was before. It was a different, mm -hmm. it was two, three, and four, I think, before. Um, and I think that that otherwise was not a change from the original um, regulations. 
In item six, the word regulations is misspelled. Oh, I think I fixed it already. <laughs> well, Good, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that ha happened. Easily. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I and I think I caught something in eight. It was inspection. The low, the final. Uh, phrase there, local inspection department, and it said of the equivalent. I I made it or the equivalent. I think that was right <laughs> to say that. Yeah, I'd, I like. I happen to like the last comma in a list, but I'd put a comma after department. But that's yeah. That, People have different opinions about this. Yeah, that's it. I've heard that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, I, so what? So there's a little bit of editing around including vaping or aerosols more in the. Mm beginning of this just to get that in there and get some of the definitions maybe into the definitions um, and I guess the one thing I don't know is like the how that ride sharing is that sound I mean it sounds okay to me but yep. I don't know if it encompasses the right uh, that well um, Anyway. And in that ride sharing that the last word public, yeah. check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Just that is weird. What hmm? What is weird, John? Uh, no, I, I, I was mostly talking to myself, but uh, just the format. I don't understand. Like four point one, why there's a why there's a there's three lines where the what Great. we used to call a carriage return occurs, but there there's weirdness in some of these things. Yeah, I know, and and some of them I couldn't make go away. So maybe oh, I'll... lovely. <laughs> 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 you know. But I will work harder on that. Yeah, you got to get rid of some. There's a whole bunch of return, uh, you know, line. Base, yeah. Uh, returns that aren't, shouldn't be there in this section. There's yeah. tons of them. And sometimes I think they move from like one page to another. Mm. Do you like to see one space between them, what, those in? No, it's not about spaces. It's about text that that doesn't wrap, it, it, it goes to the next line because there's a, a return. You, have, you know, the paragraph symbol um, is, the, is there and it's just at the end of a, those exist on items one, two, and three in the version I opened. Oh, I don't anyway. think you see that actually. Okay. Well, do you have that turned on so you can see them? You do? Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Oh. In Word, it's under View, and there's or you know, Home. Home. There's a little button you push, and it shows the. Oh, yeah, it does show a lot of paragraph symbols. Right, the unnecessary ones. So it causes line breaks at wrong places. I don't huh. know why they're in there. I don't know. Maybe they were. I don't know. I have no idea, and I don't know how to deal with those. But maybe I can. Oh, well, you just them. highlight them and delete them, and they're gone. So, the ones that shouldn't be there. The only place I'm seeing them is in that section. Oh yeah, I see that now. I never did that before. Thank you. Items one, two, and three have weird, 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 weird things. All right, I'll write that one down too, paragraphs. <laughs> All right, so um, that's great. We should. Okay.
So Move we'll on. keep on going. Yes. And Nancy, if you can, if you just want to, you know, take a picture of the tight, you know, the, that has the highlighting on yeah, it, I'll, finding it online, just send me okay. that. I'll do it by Sunday. We have, I'm doing, I'm doing uh, remote teaching tomorrow, and I have two overnight little guests tomorrow oh, night well, to Saturday. I'll try to get, so I'll get it to me. I don't think that's that should be a problem. No, and then also if on the top if you put draft and the date. Okay. So that yeah, I've been including it in the way at the end, so I'll try it right up top, top there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The file name I leave it left it there, but I'll leave it on top so we'll kind of keep track better. Oh, okay. If you want to get. Um... Thank you for all your work. Well, you're welcome. And this one isn't seemed to be quite as complex as <laughs> the tobacco sales one and that just required a lot more change so this one is more limited in scope so that's good yeah all right okay that off the table um I, while we're on smoking and tobacco i just have a question and maybe education for emma there emma can you hear me, Emma? Uh-oh, have I faded? Nope, you're good. Oh, he was muted. Oh. <laughs> he was shaking your head, okay. nodding your head. Oh, yeah. Okay, in our, in our tobacco regulations that got sent out sometime this fall and took effect January 1st, right. we, have, we have a piece that the tobacco sales permit holder has to keep on file copies of the tobacco handlers quiz that anyone who's selling tobacco in the place has to take. How can we follow up on that? Or do you have any ideas? Or are you overwhelmed with COVID? Do you want to pass it out to I don't even know how these all this stuff got out. They got mailed, but yeah. So Stephen, um, okay. I forget his last name. He's our licensing coordinator. So the he's, the one, he's the one that got all of the stuff out. Uh, thank goodness for that. Whew, that would have been a heavy lift. I know in, in other local health health boards, it's it's challenging this time of year getting everything out for December, the new year. Um, so I can follow up with him and okay. see how that's going. Um, that's no problem. Uh, I like questions then, like that. <laughs> yeah, that was just, you know, just follow up because we'll have to check and make sure it's being done. Otherwise, why do we have it? Right. Okay. All set. It's got a post it and everything, Nancy. Perfect. Makes it official. And so now we're moving on to the director's report. Maybe I should just put this in. Emma asked me a question about uh, wood burning stoves or, or smoke. Remember that, Emma? Yep, yep. So she reached out and gave me the information and I forwarded it on. Um, we had a resident call and certainly I'm new to Amherst, right? And I know I don't certainly don't know everything about the great policies that you have and everything. And I admit that. Um, so I heard uh, some concerns from a resident about um, wood, her neighbors burning wood um, and that being very smoky um, and staying around her area. So I reached out to Nancy and Nancy's expertise. And um, I was able to find that you in fact already had language surrounding that. So we forward that on to our one of our health inspectors. Um, other uh, than that, I haven't heard back yet, but um, but that was the. Uh, okay, because I just, because that's another quiz and I just looked it all up again. So I wanted to make sure you got that information that you needed. Yep, thank you okay. so much. All right, so now the director's report. 
Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Drum roll, amazing work. Oh, I my heavens. It has been a flurry. Um, I know that Stephen and, and Nancy have been able to come by. I know, uh, Maureen, you're going to come by tomorrow evening. It's going to be great. What time? Four o'clock? Yeah, you can show up any time between 4 and 4.30. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, um, let's see. Let's look at the numbers. Uh, today we saw 159. And... Um, I know on Monday we saw 202, and then I believe Tuesday night it was 100. So just really remarkable stuff. Um, one of the challenges- I haven't been there. I have to stop you, Emma. It is so well organized, so well thought out with the safety of the staff and people coming in. It was just stellar. I, I, I just have to stop you and just share that with the board. I was so impressed with all the little things you thought through for the first go, because you keep reading about how this has been a disaster throughout the country and how well um, you've initiated this piece here and you'll just build on it as we go into other phases. I, I, I was just so impressed. Well, thank, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's certainly a, a great opportunity for me to really. This is my skill set. You know, um, I really like setting up clinical events and buildings of opportunity. That's what I do with my federal job. Um, so it's been I pretty great having that be able to come at the time that we need it. Uh, Good. Can you, um, if I can just inject a question, can you remind us of who was the audience, the, the, the allowed people to take these vaccinations and did they sign up online? I just don't remember. What, no. what I read it in the paper once quickly. But. <laughs> yes, John, and that's a great question because it's changing every day. Yeah. And, and different people are saying different things, right? Like the federal recommendations and standards are, are different than the rollout here in Massachusetts, which is making it very challenging. Yeah, yeah. People. That's why I'm asking, what is this one specifically? Yeah, I understand so, there's a whole universe, but I, yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> no. So um, right now we're in phase one, step three. I'm going to try and pull up the website, um, which is first responders. I'm going to do something fancy. I'm going to share screen in a minute. You guys are going to be yeah. so impressed. All right. Way to go. <laughs> COVID vaccine. How many screens do you have in front of you? Two. Yeah, that's the challenge. You've got more than one. It's easy to screw up, I've found. I've learned. I have three in front of me. And that's, I'm always sharing the wrong one. <laughs> All right. So we're here. So this is your normal, when can I get a COVID vaccine, which is great. Lots of people have seen it. This is a kind of a small one. You have to squint your eyes to be yeah. able to read it, which is not very helpful, but boom, look at what this great thing that they just put out yesterday, which is a nice visual, which can show us all where we are in phase one distribution. So right now we can see this arrow here, which we are in week two, of January and the air, yellow arrows on the left show the, the areas that are currently being served during the distribution as approved by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health rollout. So right now, uh, COVID facing healthcare workers, most of those in the hospital, including primary care physicians, long-term care facilities, first responders, which are really the primary focus that we are looking at, and our congregate settings, meaning shelters and corrections. Um, we did start to engage Craig's Doors volunteers and staff today, which was wonderful to see um, and get them in here. And then I think with availability, I was had the great opportunity to speak with Kevin Noonan today that the guests of the shelter um, tomorrow evening, I, I do believe we, we're going to have some slots and we're going to really encourage them to get the vaccine uh, and try to do some education for those guests with them. That's great. Yeah. So um, 
so this is a really good visual, John. I think of where we are right yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. No, I I'm pretty familiar with these, and I and and I know lots of instances that go outside of those groups from various extensions of tentacles, and it's just it's interesting. And, and I was just yeah. curious of the um the and for lo lots of great logical reasons. They take it like my mother, 92 year, 91 year old mother in law got who's in, in an independent apartment, but in a huge complex of all kinds of flavors, got her vaccine first shot today um, in Worcester. Yeah. So, um, and I know like the lab techs at the IELTS lab in UMass, I think, got, got vaccinated who are doing COVID 19 tests. I think they got vaccinated at UMass today, this week. So it's good. There's some good tentacles going up. Yeah. Just yep. like you mentioned the Craig's doors folks, that's perfect. Yeah. So good. Yep. Was we were designated? Remind me, the bank UMass is on the the site. The the stuff that happened this week, the state site, um, the UMass uh, campus center. Bangs was also one that uh, responders from certain towns were supposed to sign up, or is it just show up? No, no, we're covering eight towns. Eight towns. Amherst, Belchertown, Granby, yeah. Hadley, Hatfield, Pelham, South yeah. Hadley, and Ware. And do they sign up or was it? Yep, yep. so they sign up. Good. It's through um, the mass immunization site, which is uh, this software is called PrepMod that the state has rolled out for us to use. Um, and they sign up online and you schedule an appointment and then you come. And where are our result, the results, uh, the specimens being examined for the specimens collected at Amherst? It, thanks, Anna. Well, so we're not collecting specimens. We're giving vaccinations now. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. I know. Uh, it's. I know we've had to change our lingo. Yeah, well, yeah both, both are happening on campus here. So I'm, yeah, it's easy. Yeah. yeah. And does a state agency, who delivers vaccines to a town? A, 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 the town or let's say University Health Services or something. Who, who does the... It um, yeah, it comes via UPS in the mail. I probably shouldn't say because it's probably supposed to be some super secret magic package. I don't know. <laughs> but it comes via UPS and um, it also comes with the equipment from the strategic national stockpile for 100 doses, like meaning our um, syringes, some um, alcohol preps, um, face shields. No band aids, though. <laughs> Just an interesting fact. <laughs> and and we are in our practice we are wearing gloves i know that has been a concern in other sites um, it's not necessarily indicated per the cdc with giving vaccinations um, but we felt very strongly about being able to wear them we are using a reduced waste model meaning that our staff are, are sanitizing their gloves in between patients um, but that way, they're at least wearing something, which I know is is important to patients and then also some clinical staff. So we wanted to make sure those people felt validated. What? So this week, our program was just this week? This week for first responders, yep. And then um, we did reach out to the state because um, they reached out. Uh, to local boards of health that were doing vaccine programs for first responders about uh, possibility of continuing throughout three phases of distribution. Uh, I spoke with Paul Bockelman about that and he does support that. So we put that through in terms of an interest in some, something to continue. Um, we have not heard back yet because we just submitted that on Wednesday, but hopefully more to come. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there, there's lots of work to be done. I think this is really a, a team effort uh, with that, like you said, John, you talk about those tentacles. I think we're gonna be able to, there's gonna be multiple pathways where people are gonna be able to access this vaccine. I know that there are going to be smaller sites like ours would be. And then the state is planning on several, what they call mass vaccination sites, like at Gillette um, or the Topsfield fairgrounds and I think I believe I heard maybe the Big E but more to come with that. What, what percentage of our first responders from Amherst do you think have been vaccinated? Oh that's a good question. I, I would have to go back and review the data but I saw a whole lot of them come through um, and extremely good feedback just so thankful about us putting this on for them um, oh, and, and showing our commitment 
to our community, you know, uh, I, I think just is remarkable that we were able to do that. And, and we also got that continued thanks, not just from our own here in Amherst, but for the other towns that we were able oh, to yeah. support. Yeah. And those, those uh, first responders could also just opt to go to UMass, that part was confusing to me. So it's like a, an altered two sites there. So ours is really dedicated to the Hampshire first responders. The UMass site is a, a catch-all, if you will. There yeah. are many counties and uh, municipalities that weren't able to stand up sites um, mm -hmm. and that weren't able to be vaccinated on the local level. So UMass is a site that's available to all those individuals that don't necessarily fall under a smaller umbrella. I see. Yep. I, I have this uh, hope that the UMass site is uh, gearing geared up so that those of my faculty and staff and TAs who are doing face-to-face -face instruction starting in two weeks uh, will have a chance to get vaccinated sooner than later, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of categories, right? Lots of need. Yeah. <laughs> How do you prioritize? That's really uh, well, and the fact, John, that that I'm not the one doing the prioritizing, right? Yeah, no. And no. and that makes it so hard. Um, yeah. And especially when today we did have, um, I think people are so anxious about getting this vaccine, right? And people want to make sure that they get it as soon as they can. And we did have uh, quite a number of seniors sign up for vaccines today. Um, cause unfortunately they had heard from a, from an un true, uh, an uneducated source that they could get the vaccine and we yeah. didn't have to turn them away because yeah. they're, they're not under what DPH has, has given us as a very clear guide of the population that we're supposed to vaccinate at this time. Um, and then just before this meeting, I, I was actually calling uh, seniors that had signed up for our, our vaccine um, clinic tomorrow evening to try and let them know now. So, mm -hmm. um, so is the sign up sheet not as clear as it should be? I mean, the header should be like, "You yeah. are eligible <laughs> if." <laughs> the header on the on the town webpage is very specific like that. Unfortunately, when you go into the sign up, which is that state software that that's what on, I mean, yeah, we don't have any control. No, because it's the state. Yeah. yeah, but it's not as specific as it should be. It seems if yeah, yeah, it's not. It was not built to do this kind of no specific no. thing. No. So no. no. Um, <laughs> So we're, we're trying to make do as we can. And um, I know we, it was a great opportunity. We had the COVID ambassadors come over um, and help us uh, with our, some of our outside time um, to be able to help engage some people as they came and greet our guests and, and be able to spend that extra moment that um, I know I'm stay pretty busy in the clinic trying to make sure everything's running well. Uh, but they're really, a, they were able to give that kind of extra moment to people to make them feel acknowledged and appreciated, even if we weren't giving them the answer that they really wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I know that Jennifer Brown and I are just really excited about this next step. Um, we've been working alongside the fire department, Jeff Olmstead and Chief Nelson, and the paramedics are helping being vaccinators and the school nurses. I just... And, and then our, our great volunteers that have come. Um, it's just really remarkable to see everybody coming together for this kind of next step. Um, and I just wanna thank each of you, you know, and your support as well to be able to make it possible. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you all. <laughs> you wouldn't be at this meeting, that's for sure. Well, that's you wouldn't right. be at this meeting, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't actually have any say in hiring you, so yeah. <laughs> But we're glad you're here. Yeah. I have a question for you, Emma. I saw in the newspaper that the Hanley Board of Health, which is doing something amazing, they're having a Zoom COVID education piece. Yeah, that was yesterday you, evening with the select board. Talk about it, and do you think that's worthwhile doing here in Amherst? I think it would be great. 
because I've always been saying we need to educate people and I hadn't thought of that. And I, I said, wow, wait a minute, this sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be really fun. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about it and how do we start setting it up? No, yeah, so it was actually, it was through our, the select board and uh, one of our board of health members, Dr. Mosler, mm -hmm. and they were able to say that we were going to be out there. I know one of our special, we had two special guests, right. Dr. Joanne Levin and Dr. Esteban Garcia from Cooley, mm -hmm. and they were terrific. Um, and then uh, the superintendent of schools, Annie McKenzie spoke about the school safety and everything. And then I spoke a little bit on um, metrics and data and trends and did a little PowerPoint um, for that to kind of show the Hadley data over time. Um, so it was well received for Hadley. It was a big meeting. We had 60 people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we had some really great questions, you know, and at least even if we weren't able to answer everyone's questions, we were at least able to give them resources, um, like the where to go to find regular new information. So yeah, I think it would be great. I, I know that I had mentioned me and Paul had briefly discussed it a couple days ago because he had seen the same thing <laughs> and, and he thought it was would be a great idea too, to mm -hmm. have. Sounds so, good. Should the Board of Health sponsor it? I think, uh, I personally think that would be terrific I in a way to get- the Town Council because Monday Town Council was crazy. Yeah, and long. Yes, that's what I meant by crazy, so long. <laughs> Not like it's crazy, but the hours. Oh, um, that's a long meeting. You know, I've been to meetings, but that town council, that's a meeting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Emma, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. You know, I, I was um, working with Amherst Neighbors, which for those who don't know is a uh, a volunteer organization that aims to provide social interaction and services to Amherst seniors. And one of the questions that came up was we're trying to think about what services we can actually provide as, as time goes on here, was whether, what, what's the thinking about getting the vaccine to seniors who are living on their own, but might not be able to drive or get to the site of the vaccine? Yeah, so I love that question because Jen Brown and I have already thought about it. <laughs> oh, good. I, I read Uber and Lyft is giving rides, but I didn't free. No, no we're actually really interested in, in doing a mobile clinics and doing uh -huh. push distribution, uh, meaning that if someone lived in an apartment complex, like is it Ann Whalen that's with the housing authority? Mm -hmm. That like we would go and do a clinic there or more than one clinic there um, or some of these other housing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what we've kind of been envisioning. And I know Jeff Olmsted from the fire department was also thinking that uh, unprompted today. So that was really neat to see. But not thought about people who live out and about in the, in the, their own homes or whatever. No, we could do that too mm -hmm. when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Yep. How home visits. <laughs> right. Maureen, you and uh, you and Leslie could do that. Spend a bunch of time going around and giving, giving people vaccines. Right. Mm. Um, but just think, you know, just thinking about that vulnerable, those vulnerable groups who, who mm -hmm. might not be as mobile to get in line and drive their car to Big E or whatever. Yeah. And, and certainly even the younger population that still might have those barriers to transportation, right. right. multi-generational families right. um, in apartment complexes, uh, we're, we're trying to think about that now. Mm -hmm. So that way we can meet them in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are a lot of sites that would be, um, would benefit from a, a outreach and mobile administration, it sounds yeah. like. So you guys are ahead of me, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's the things that I wake up in the middle of the night going, oh, I didn't think about that yet. I got to write that down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, Emily, but Emily, you were even 
forward thinking because you ordered those travel packs that you mm -hmm. can take the vet out to mobile clinics. So yep. she's on the ball and has it already. Right. Yep, we have the equipment to do it. We have two mobile packs that'll maintain their temps. They're on wheels. Um, they're very protected. Um, I was able to purchase those when I bought our free fridge and our freezer that can also maintain those temps mm -hmm. off um, without power for five days uh, with the remainder rate remainder of our CARES money from um, from the fall. Um, and I and we did actually just recently get, I believe, another twenty thousand um, dollars, which was great to see. So, uh, and I think the Piner Valley Planning Commission they had sent out a questionnaire this week, a survey, because they were being allotted, um, I believe it was two hundred thirty thousand dollars, but it's to support all of their communities that are under their umbrella, but for continued asking for continued funds if we could use them. Of course we can use them. By golly, I can always find a use for stuff. Um, for And those funds would be able to be used for COVID testing, um, media materials. But I envision being able to set up more of a mobile testing clinic, probably going to different apartment facilities where there's a large density of population and people might not be able to easily go to a site like Mill River, you know, because um, I really want to meet people where they're at, not necessarily have people have to come to me, you know. I think it would mean a lot I, I, to, for people to see us out there. I know in the short time for our vaccine clinic here, people have really said that, that wow, the town of Amherst is here and, and they're helping us. What, what's your sense? I go, we can go and keep talking about this. I know you, you're trying to give a report. We just have questions, but if it's okay to keep asking questions. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Um, I probably sense, won't have the answer. Now, what's your sense of uh, the supply rate, which is the versus from the state to versus the rate we can administer vaccines? How are we, is the supply going to constrain us? Um, I hope not. I know that they send out a survey every week that I submitted yesterday asking us how many we're going through and what could our clinic support and go through a week. Good. Um, this is DPH? Yep, so that's DPH. So that was reassuring because um, they're asking for the amount that we can go through. And I mean, we can, we could easily administer I'm not a math person. This is shameful. My brother would be so embarrassed. <clears throat> My brother has his PhD in math and, math and astrophysics. Uh, <laughs> we can do about 600 <laughs> vaccines a week. Um, <laughs> he's the smart one. I, I can talk to people. So, <laughs> um, so we can do the strength. That's thank you, Nancy. <laughs> So we can, uh, we've let DPH know the amount that we can go through uh, in that survey. And right now that's how they are trying to get a hold on how much vaccine to push out. Mm -hmm. um, they're also looking at uh, with the MIIS in mm -hmm. real time, the amount that we're processing to get a hold on that too. Cause they don't want people to kind of hoard stuff mm -hmm. if they can't deliver it. Mm. Yeah. I was interested because I didn't look at this week's, but last week's report on vaccines mm -hmm. that that was pretty uneven in the counties. Like Berkshire had like I can't even remember six percent of what, and like yeah. Franklin had like two percent, and we were at three percent. And I was just curious if you had thoughts about that. I have no idea about that. I would have to look at that better, but I've been so busy, like trying no, to. No, I know. It was just a curiosity. And I wondered, oh. is that because the hospital, you know, the hospital numbers versus regular population? Yeah, I bet you it's probably hospitals, right? And right. long term care facilities were the only ones referenced. Right. In that. So my guess is maybe per capita, they have more of those people in Berkeley. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, if we think about our density, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah compared to out east. 
those people east of Worcester. Yeah. There's so many of them. I just I opened the, uh, the, the weekly report from today. It must have come out just in the last half hour. I just opened it up and it's a little disappointing on delivery to the state of vaccines was zero last week, essentially. Yeah, uh, new, I know. New stuff, unfortunately. Yeah, I know Bay State was stating they were um, depleting their supply on Monday and we're hoping for a shipment. Um, is today Wednesday? No, today's Thursday. So they were supposed to get a shipment yesterday. Oh, uh, so this is through the 12th. It's in uh, a bunch of zeros, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be nice to get them, but but hey, 33,000 people have their second dose already, so that's good. And speaking of that, so Emma, you don't have any control over, you know, you can't be absolutely sure that you're going to have them for the second dose, or, or can you be sure? Well, they, that that's something that DPH initially said we are secure in, um, and I think with the changing climate of possible distribution, um, they're not sure now. Yeah. So more to come. Because yeah. you do have a whole clinic set up for the second doses of these uh, first responders in yep. four or five weeks. Yeah. We sure do. Right. UMass did, I saw they advertised the same thing one month later, essentially four weeks. For this. Yeah. The UMass site for the state, I, not UMass. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just happens to be a physical location. Actually, it's not UMass. I know. And then it's like, is it the UMass site in Amherst or is it the Amherst site at the main <laughs> center? Who's, uh, who's staffing the, do you know who's staff doing the um, the one at the campus center? Is it Ann Becker and staff? Or? Yep. Yep. It's Ann Becker and her crew. Um, I'm not sure if there's some nurses, nursing students that might be here a little early doing some clinical stuff. Maybe the, what I'm thinking is maybe those the like accelerated students that don't do the traditional, um, they usually go through intercession and in summer and everything. It's so more interesting than watching people swab their nose in the campus center, in oh. the Mellon Center, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Does that, do you guys have any other questions? Look at Na Nancy no. stumped. I have no, one question. Um, I last time at our last meeting, you had said that the Amherst numbers had suddenly flipped from being mostly UMass related uh -huh. to suddenly community related, and yeah. I wondered if that has persisted and how tr contact tracing and all of that is going in the midst of all of what else you're doing. Yeah, so we've really made the decision. We are doing some contact tracing, but not a ton. Um, this, there are some school nurses that continue to wanna to be involved in that, but not all, and we're respecting that. Um, and many of the cases we are sending over to the CTC at this point, the contact, contact tracing collaborative through the Partners in Health. Um, John Welch is their head person and put on a great uh, presentation last week where their capture rate, meaning um, the amount of people they're making end contact with for contract tracing since they've increased staff and really onboarded people has once again increased um, to about 80%, which is pretty standard for what we were being able to complete on the local level. And um, by being able to, for us to engage the CTC, we're able to shift our focus on okay. vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the data, I do know that uh, the college age population does slowly start to increase again. Uh, by slowly, I mean right after New Year's. It seems like a whole bunch of them got together. Um, so we've been watching that, uh, but we still do continue to have those multi-generational families um, involved and children. I believe right now we have a two-year-old so, yeah. I, I was uh, me meaning to ask this question, which I've forgotten, but came back to my mind and brought up by this. Um, so given the contact tracing that's going, um, why is 
our case rate in Massachusetts, unfortunately, in the top 10 of the country, you know, per capita. It, I understand, you know, it's mostly in the dense Eastern Mass, but what are people saying for, for reasons of transmission? What, what, what are we still doing so horribly wrong? What, what, are, <laughs> what social behaviors are yes, still happening? What, uh, even with these mitigation yeah. strategies um, that people are starved for their families and their friends and their loved ones. And just can't keep being isolated. And they can't, they've reached this point in the pandemic where people really felt like they had to get together over the holidays or New Year's. Um, they continue to have gatherings or birthday parties. Um, and every, not everyone, that's that's mischaracterization. But I, I do hear from quite a number of individuals that, you know, I have the right to make my own decisions about risk and sports and um, going out and doing this activity. And, and I think inherently um, that is something that people, especially in the United States, take on with a lot of pride, being able to have that independent kind of thing. And and that makes it very challenging in uh, in a pandemic to be able to control. So yep. Yep. people don't like to be told what to do, John. No, 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 <laughs> no. And um, here's the other belt. If you take uh, cumulative cases per capita and look at the data, like in the New York Times. So, you know, we had North Dakota, horrible. They're, they're up to about 12% of the population from the testing has had, the, has had COVID. I'll bet you it's much higher. So maybe they got, they're pushing herd immunity. Is that why their cases are dropping down? I can't imagine their behavior changed. I, I, I do not think their behavior changed. So is it herd, herd immunity due to contract, you know? Yeah, I don't know. North I mean, Dakota did finally put in a, in a mask order, whereas South Dakota, I don't think did. I'm uh, not sure orders and behavior in North Dakota are gonna carry much weight. <laughs> it might. That's <laughs> your two cents. through there this summer, but anyway. Um, uh, it's in, it's fascinating. There's so much data that's going to be analyzed, and seven million papers written on this stuff. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, I like Steve. Steve shared with us a plot of the Amherst cases over time. I loved that. Seven per day for the last hundred days. It's like dead linear. Quite linear, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't yeah. no longer have the data to do the UMass. Well, there's a big gap in UMass. I have it. I just thought it was clear to just give the Amherst because the yeah. UMass, first of all, their their number of of uh, tests per week has gone way down, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't really show anything at this point. Now, when okay. school starts up again, you, if you really do have large numbers of UMass students, then it's going to be quite interesting. I'll still keep track of it, of course. But yeah, I did see that green line. So Steve, that data was excluding any, it's, it's what the town is on our website every day? Correct. But that includes off-campus students, right? They're yes, it moves, the whatever the town knows, whatever, you know, what, I don't know, Emma, you can say where that exact number comes from and who counts as a resident, but it's just what is posted on the town website every day. Which, Emma, that's students in off-campus housing, right? Correct. Oh yeah, if they live yeah. in Amherst, they should be yeah. there. Yeah. So that's essentially all of them, because on campus is a is in the noise. On campus cases were only twenty or thirty, you know, yeah. fifty. Yeah. It's not important. So um, it, it's fascinating to me. It's that linear. Given people talk about holidays and the bump after this and the bump after that, not in Amherst. It's seven a day, no matter what we're doing. Interesting. Fascinating. John, what's happening with students coming back to UMass? Do you, have you heard? No, I, I think we're all waiting. The chancellor's got to weigh in. I'll predict tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, uh, just to guess, uh, there's sort of a two-week window that was used in the summer when the last, you know, there was a big change two weeks out. You, it's tough, tough to demobilize or mobilize a bunch of housing related things that close. Um, so I've heard no indication that that they're not going to do what was advertised. Um, there's no indication of that. Um, we're all preparing from a teaching and instructor point of view, face-to-face -face classes, labs, saw a lot of boxes and masks and 
face shields and stuff arriving in, in our college. Um, I did te doing testing, you know, on, on um, the week I go every week and get my test. And in line, it was clearly, this was Monday, people like coming back to work in dining facility. I mean, they were like, yeah, I got assigned here or what it, it, it's, I think things are gearing. I mean, you're not gonna have 5,000 people show up in dorms two weeks plus two days from now without being getting ready. So, um, and I think students were encouraged to come as much as a week beforehand uh, to quarantine. There's a lot of testings and stuff going on. So I don't know. Emma, what do you know from town gown? Is there any trigger point decision making you've heard about? I Tim, have, have you heard anything? I have not. Um, I have not heard that they are committed to changing any decision. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I heard I, not as many students registering to come back as they had hoped. That's what I had heard. Yeah. But it's they were nice. hoping for 6,000. And I think they only got a little bit over five. Yeah, the initial predictions were as high as eight, and and uh, that dropped back to about five. In addition to the, uh, yeah, fifty four hundred was the last number I heard. But but even I think they can renege even very, you know, soon in terms of coming on campus. I I mostly see it with some of our face to face classes. I'm dealing with students who. For various reasons choose not to come and they're supposed to be in a face-to-face -face lab part of a class and how are we going to deal with that that's Jeez, that's, that's oh the things God, we're trying. i can't even imagine oh. so then i got to figure out are they graduating in may or are they graduating when which semester could they take it so it involves a bunch of stuff <laughs> that's weird and we get our grad various students who'd like to go to graduate school caught in various countries i'm sure I'm sure that's in your department too, Tim, where you've had Timothy, where you, in ECO, there must be some students who can't get here. We've got plenty. It's hard. No, we can't. So I don't know. I, I think everybody's expecting some announcement. You know. But nothing yet. I think Smith and Mount Holyoke are students are coming or are arriving. I heard that Mount Holyoke was on track. I didn't hear anything new from, you know, I still talk to people there a little bit. Um, I, again, I don't know if they'll be pulling the plug, you know, but. At Amherst, they delayed the, the uh, return of many of the students for a couple of weeks, but they are going ahead and they're, you know, they have, a you have to get, you have tested as soon as you arrive. And some students who were cleared beforehand were tested positive already after mm. they arrived. So, but they're doing a pretty good job of isolating them, don't you think, Emma? I mean, you, you probably don't see anything to do with Amherst College. Well, we actually communicate very regularly with em Dr. Emily Jones and uh, Matt Hart, their emergency manager. Um, they do an incredible job with their team with contact tracing and then getting their students into isolation or quarantine and making sure that they're supported and able to do that fully and safely. Um, so really, I think they are, have, would, would be a great model for other institutions for that. Did they, are they inviting all students back? No, not, not all, but still, many more. Still, but more than the fall? Way more, way more than the fall. So I think it's going to be, in the fall they had maybe 600, I think it was, or something like that. And it's going to be 1, at least. 1,200, 1,200 students. At Amherst, no. For this spring or for the last fall? Oh, yeah, this spring, this spring, yes. Yeah. For the spring, correct, yeah. Hampshire is expecting about 500 to 550. That's everybody. Mount Holyoke was expecting about a little bit over 1,000. That's about 50 to 60%, I would guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Smith was expecting 1,300. I'm looking at my notes from a five college meeting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll see. <laughs> uh, what's the level of concern? I, I thought you haven't brought it up, but what, what are towns people, <laughs> what level of concern are people uh, have about this, you know, the students returning? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of direct, we haven't gotten a lot of direct reports here at the health department for that. I think people are so focused on the vaccine for us. Um, yeah. But I know that, you know, I have family in the area who's a little worried. Mm -hmm. So. What kind of calls are you getting on the COVID line? Do you get a sense of what's coming in for that? Yeah, I, I do. I am included in that file. Let me open. But I know that they're primarily answered by Angela Mills or um, Jen Moylston in the main office. But here it's a lot about um, some groups, some are, man, I've been exposed, what do I do? Um, or some um, are, it tends to go in waves because a couple weeks ago it was all, about the testing, right? And where was my testing site and are we setting up again? And then um, every once in a while, we do get questions about rental assistance and resources that we can refer, give to people for help, for social services. Um, but a lot of times too, it's about compliance concerns. So it kind of varies. Great. Anything else? I don't think I have much. I don't see any topic. Anybody else? Questions? Second Thursday in February, okay. February 11th. I don't that's right. It'll February be here 11. before we know it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Emma, do you want to think about a public education thing sponsored through the Board of Health, the Health Department, and the Board of Health? I think that would be great. Um, I think we should do it soon. What do you think? How do we go about doing this? Uh, yeah, sooner better than because people are going to have lots of questions about the vaccine, when they can get it, where they can get it. You know, I, I'm sure that's going to be a big question. Was that one of the questions that came out a lot yesterday for you? Yeah. In a, in Hadley. Yeah, it sure was. I think we should try to do it next week. My husband might, might not agree with that, but I think it would be great. You think one week's enough? Or you think two weeks would be better? Well, I think two weeks. Next week's, week's a holiday. Oh, that's right. You're right. Um, I, I think two weeks would be better, but I know that there is all of this desire for, for information from people. Um, and anxiety. So if we did it like the beginning of the following week, but so it's less than two weeks, you know, like 10 days, like the 25th or 26th? Yeah, let me, what I will do is I will reach out to Paul and Brianna and Angela and we can see um, maybe which day would be better depending on maybe other meetings and stuff. Um, okay. And then I know Brianna can work on on getting the probably Tuesday because counselors on meeting Monday. on Monday. <laughs> That's a great point, Nancy. Now, what role do you see us as a board having? Um, I think I know in Hadley, like Dr. Mosler was kind of like our moderator who got to introduce the speakers, um, which was kind of nice to see. Certainly I know Hadley and Amherst, have a we have a different setup for our boards of health and health departments. But I think if, if you wanted to take on that role to kind of like introduce me and then I can try and 
engage Dr. Levin mm -hmm. um, and Esteban. Yeah. Okay. I think that would be great. What do you think? I think it'll be excellent. Hey, whenever I read that, I said, hey, why didn't we think of that? And I said, we got to tap Emma. I didn't think of it either. I have to <laughs> defer to Dr. Mosler. My big man is we've got to educate people. We've got to educate people. And I never got beyond my mantra. Um, so <laughs> well, now hey, we are. An example over there. Yeah. So I'll, re I'll okay. reach out tomorrow. So should I talk? Oh, yeah, and Monday's a holiday. Should I talk to you on Tuesday? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, great. So I'll call you and you can tell me or we can figure out what best to communicate with you. Sounds good. I just want to uh, if Nancy, if I can mention two things. In sure, I would say anybody public, else has something to say. Yeah, in, in public health, um, that just there are, these are the long, my long-term engagement on projects we're doing for the state of Massachusetts, but there's reasons for each of them to maybe be a little more. So you may have heard the news yesterday that a couple that former governors of Michigan and other of us were indicted in a, in a civil court anyway, you know, yeah. all the other cases got thrown out on Flint and lead in, in drinking water in Flint. So that's got a little, got some press yesterday. And uh, the, the pediatrician who, you know, looked, found the high blood blood level. She was interviewed on NPR this morning. Um, uh -huh. Mona, the author of this book here, What the Eyes Don't See, um, uh, about her, her, you know, finding the proof, which is the blood blood levels of children having raised doubled and stuff. So, so that issue might come up, and and in that, in in the little higher, uh, the lead project that we're doing for the state, you know, we're really, really, really struggling to get childcare providers to be interested to sign up. There's just they're just trying to float and stay. So COVID dominates everything from the public health perspective. But if you yeah. Run across or meet a child child care provider. Uh, don't hesitate to talk about the free lead testing program we're we're doing. The state is doing to help to for them to you know have samples collected and measured for lead to safeguard kids' health. So that's one thing. And then the other one project we're doing for the state is there's a new regulation on this compounds PFAS in drinking water that came into effect. Uh, it's, uh, Various size pu public water supplies, depending on your size, have to sample, have to start sampling starting this month, depending of the big ones and working its way down. Um, there's also a program that is uh, targeting, trying to find sources by targeting 81 communities that have 60% or more of the residents supplied by private wells. Um, and, and private uh -huh. well owners are being invited to perhaps have their well water tested for PFAS. And the first two, our first two pilot communities in the program were Belchertown and Granby um, that, that got postcards sent last week uh, that looked like, uh, you, you can't see it, but anyway, there's a picture of a wellhead in, uh, picture of a wellhead and does your well contain PFAS? And, <laughs> and uh, that, that went out and we'll see where that goes. I have a feeling there won't be a lot of volunteering for that either, but we'll we'll see what happens. So, anyway, PFAS, lead, public health, drinking water. You might hear more about it. So, just want to let you know I've if been you have questions. It in the and thinking of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is Amherst going to be testing for PFAS, or do they already do check for PFAS? Um, they haven't tested uh, our uh, yet, but will be. They're required to, I, and I'm forgetting. I forget the size schedule. To be honest, it, it, there's the littlest ones are long ways out, and the bigger ones are uh, sooner. And I can't remember about Amherst right now. It's uh, it's source based. So um, what percentage? What do you know? What percentage of our homes are on private wells versus water? Do you know how many? What percentage of our homes are on private wells versus uh, public uh, water near in Amherst? Well, population-wise, probably 5% are on private wells, 95% public, if I had to guess. I don't know. 
we're, we're way up there. I know there's I, I, the, uh, something, some number like that, way up there. We're not, the, the private well thing is, that doesn't apply to Amherst. Whereas Belchertown is, you know, there's almost 15,000 people in Belchertown and like 12,000 of them are on wells. I mean, it, it, yeah, wow. it's, it's one of the big, big ones. Granby's pretty high to 80 or 90%, you know, 80% on wells. The, of the 81, it quickly drops down into hundreds of people. You know, we get a lot of towns <laughs> in the Commonwealth with total populations of 600 people. But, um, you know, when you get up to the bigger, I was surprised. Belchertown's one of the bigger, frac, bigger total absolute populations served by private wells. Um, it's like yeah, and they have carbon in it. Yeah, that's a different, yeah. Those, <laughs> I know, I know. Go someplace else, but yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Oh, it's uh, it, and there's a if you Google around, there's a great public facing dashboard. Story map is a word that's used in the GIS world now to tell stories of GIS and maps and things. There's there's one in the DP site. State of New Hampshire has a really amazing site too. But we have a, a we meaning Massachusetts has a quite a very stringent regulation, as does Vermont and New Hampshire. But this is one of those areas of health that states have taken action because the federal government hasn't. So. Mm. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, it's a sites, you know, like a big car accident that that had a petroleum-based fire that had a triple F. Uh, that's uh, firefighting foam uh, sprayed can be a future site of groundwater contamination, you know, a site of future groundwater contamination. So it's it's it, it's a yeah, interesting story. Well, it's, it's a story of humans <laughs> in the globe. So. Anyway, yeah. just want to mention that, that um, those things are going on and you might hear about it. Nothing really Amherst-y, you know, about this, but. Yeah, uh, no, I was following the Michigan piece. Yeah, yeah, Flint is. Hmm. Are, there Are there comments from anybody? Okay. Well, if not, our meeting can be, someone can make a motion to close our meeting till our February one. Um, and Emma and I will keep you posted about the public education on uh, COVID. Okay, I'll move. Any we, comments? I'll move. We, oh, I'll, I'll move. We adjourn. I second it. Okay, all in favor. Maureen. Aye. Steve. Aye. John. Aye. Jim. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Okay, well, thank you all. Have a good month. Be safe and Emma, keep up the amazing work yeah. you and Jen are yeah. doing. Absolutely stellar. Thank you. Totally. Thank you. Okay. Good Thank night, you, everybody. everybody. Bye. <laughs>